our first speaker, Dr. Lynn Orr, who was nominated by President Obama and confirmed by the Senate to serve as the Undersecretary uh, for Science and Energy. Under Undersecretary Dr. Orr, uh, no, sorry, uh, Undersecretary Dr. Orr is the principal advisor to the Secretary of Energy uh, on energy technologies and fundamental research initiatives, including DOE's programs in scientific computing. And so uh, it will be very, uh, so it's very good to have him here on our conference. Um, I was surprised when I read about uh, Dr. Orr's background. So he's extremely well prepared actually for that role. Uh, so prior to joining the Department of Energy, Dr. Orr held academic and leadership appointments at Stanford University. Uh, he was the Dean of Earth Sciences, the founding director of the Precord Institute for Energy, and the founding director of the Stanford uh, Global Climate and Energy Project. Not only that, but uh, he's also a member of the National Acab Academy of Engineering, and he's an, a chemical engineer in training. So please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Orr on the stage for his talk. Well, thanks, Bern, for the uh, introduction. I, I have to say that uh, I'm uh, sort of astonished and pleased that uh, the two speakers this morning both have uh, deep earth sciences uh, uh, connections. That shows a lot of good judgment on the part of the, uh, of the computing community. But my job uh, today is not so much to talk about earth sciences. Instead, it's to talk about energy. Uh, and energy, of course, is woven through the fabric of modern lives. It's pretty hard to imagine uh, doing what we do today without uh, access to electricity, without uh, uh, a, a sort of uh, endless weaving uh, together of, uh, of uh, forms of energy and, and the ways we use them. So supplying that to the world uh, in the future, but at the same time uh, making it deal with the, the realities of the planet, uh, is something that we really all have to take on. Now, we start with some primary energy resource, and then we convert it into energy services like electricity and lights and heat and, uh, and so on. So the question is, how do we do that, and how can we make all of that work better? Um, we have uh, uh, done a, uh, a couple of important reports this year. One, a quadrennial energy review that looks at the energy infrastructure for the company, the country. Uh, and then uh, we have a, a report that I'm going to talk about today, the Quadrennial Technology Review, uh, which looks at the state of energy technologies uh, and asks uh, what the opportunities for research are in the future. So today what I'll do is uh, talk a little bit about what, uh, uh, what we found, uh, what the research opportunities are, uh, and where we might go in the future. And I'll try to weave that together with a few examples of computing that uh, is such an important underlying component of everything we do. It's worth noting that uh, in the four years since the first quadrennial technology review, a lot has changed. Uh, and so it's actually a good time for another such review. Uh, one such change is a, a big uh, reduction in costs of uh, renewable technologies like wind. Uh, and a big increase in deployment uh, for those. Wind is up to 4.5% now of the electricity generation in this country, uh, and the costs have come down in the best resource places. They're competitive now without a subsidy. Uh, on the, the um, solar side, uh, utility photovoltaics are now being deployed. Again, this is the reason for this is a, a substantial reduction in costs, uh, and that's the result of uh, Lots of manufacturing experience, uh, 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 a lot of investment in China, uh, a lot of research to, to uh, reduce costs. Uh, and you might say, well, great, it's good, that's solved. We don't have to do that anymore. But the fact is that we can drive these costs down a lot more with additional research. So I'll say more about that in a minute. Um, uh, in uh, those of us uh, around the, the country who have installed uh, 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 PV systems at our home are also contributing. There's been a big reduction here in price and also a big increase in deployment. Um, and uh, something that uh, you know, I think is actually quite astonishing is that, uh, that LEDs now have uh, uh, declined about 90% in price over the last five years. So, uh, so that reduction really is uh, uh, 
uh, tells you something about uh, how costs uh, can change with manufacturing experience. Uh, but since these things uh, use maybe 15% of, uh, of the energy that an incandescent bulb is, there really is a big opportunity to save energy and, and uh, do, a, uh, do a, a, a good things along the way. And then in the, um, in the battery side, uh, electric vehicles are starting to take their place now. This is, again, the result of, of reductions in battery costs and improvements in energy density and power density. Uh, so the net result of all of this is that there's a lot of change underway in the, uh, uh, in the energy landscape. Uh, the United States is now the biggest uh, producer of oil and gas uh, in the world. I think uh, five years ago, we wouldn't have anticipated that that uh, would happen. Uh, and then there's a lot else going on. So it's time to take another look at where we stand on all of this. So what do we want from a, an energy system? There are really three important components of this. Uh, one is energy security. Uh, every society wants to be able to operate without the potential for disruption uh, uh, of the energy systems that they depend on. This means that it should be a diversified system. It should be uh, diversified both on the uh, primary energy uh, resource side and also on the supply side. There's economic security, which means uh, cost-efficient energy systems. Much of what we do in the research components on energy at the Department of Energy is aimed at reducing costs of systems so that uh, our economy can be more competitive and provide jobs uh, and, uh, and be an efficient uh, contributor to the economy. And then there's the environmental side. Uh, we know now uh, that uh, greenhouse gases and climate change are a substantial challenge, that energy is a primary way that we humans interact with the global systems that we, alas, take pretty much for granted. Uh, and that means that we need to do a much better job of balancing our use of energy with, uh, with the climate challenge and with other emissions challenges that are associated with, uh, with um, energy use. So uh, those th three things can go together. Um, and I think we, what we should remember is that we now have this opportunity to create manage and manage linked complex systems that deal with all three of these challenges simultaneously. And it is pretty much impossible to imagine doing this without uh, uh, high performance computing uh, underlying much of what we have to do. So now I just emphasize again that this, uh, what we have here is a snapshot uh, because cost change particularly with deployment. So the LED example that I gave you, 90% uh, 90, 90 uh, uh, reduction in cost since 2008, that's just because the, a lot of manufacturing experience has been gained. But you see the cost curves here for the other uh, technologies I've mentioned. Driving down costs makes it possible to do things uh, in a competitive way that we uh, can't couldn't do otherwise, but we should remember that this will continue, that this competition amongst energy resources and how they're deployed will continue in time. Uh, so it's actually fun to think about where things will go, but hard to predict. So um, some of you have undoubtedly seen a diagram like this. Uh, on the, uh, uh, the left side here, you see the um, uh, energy resources, solar, nuclear, hydro, wind, geothermal, natural gas, coal, biomass, and petroleum. To first order, petroleum is used to, for transportation, uh, and the other fuels go toward uh, uh, electric power generation and direct use of thermal energy. So the, the quadrennial technology review is kind of organized around this. Uh, the icons on the side, power generation is one, uh, fuels is another. On the right side, uh, there are the uses. And they're broadly uh, distributed amongst buildings, manufacturing, and transportation. And in between those, the connective tissue is the grid. Uh, and by that, I mean the full transmission and distribution system. So that, uh, that kind of knits all of this together. So I'll, I'll march through a few of these with some computing examples on the way. So let me start with the grid. Um, we, uh, historically, we had a modest number of, well, thousands, but a modest number of, uh, of relatively big power plants uh, sitting on a backbone with largely radial distribution of uh, electric power through the, the uh, uh, transmission and distribution system. Um, it was minimally censored uh, in the sense that it had, uh, uh, you know, they had 
Uh, well, to give you an example, I, in the early 2000s, I spent a day at the California Independent System Operator. And in those days, um, it took them about a second to, kept, to uh, acquire the data on the, the, the state of uh, voltage and, uh, uh, and um, uh, uh, phase angle and such. And uh, then three seconds to compute the state of the system. Um, and then they could think about whether an adjustment was needed. And, uh, uh, and uh, so the cycle time for uh, modifying, bringing generation assets on or turning them up and down was tens of seconds. But nowadays, especially with lots of uh, intermittent renewables on the grid, the time scale for things to go south if something happens uh, is much shorter than that. So that really was not an adequate control system. Now, when the, the uh, financial crisis came in uh, uh, 2008, one of the ways we invested funds to keep, to kind of stimulate the economy was to install uh, what are called phaser measurement units. These give you voltage and frequency and phase angle and they're time synchronized so that you can tell uh, where things are going in a certain uh, place and the, and the information is gathered. This gave visibility uh, for uh, what was uh, happening on the grid. And for example, the 2003 blackout that did occur because uh, a line was overloaded and sagged and hit a tree and cascaded, that could have, could have been stopped had we had these assets in place. So the message here is that we're partway through uh, a big uh, revamping, a modernization of the grid that's very important to our, our future. What we need to move to is a system that is flexible and resilient, can tolerate lots of renewables, has lots of sensors and data, uh, which means that we also have to deal effectively with all the data. Uh, and it offers the, pros the possibility of, uh, of automatic controls and optimization in ways that uh, could only be dreamed about even just a few years ago. That's a work in progress and we need to, to, to do much more. You can imagine microgrids that are islandable so that they, uh, they can operate even when uh, uh, Hurricane Sandy has knocked some uh, pieces offline, uh, and they can recover much more quickly. Uh, the, the millions of smart meters that have now been uh, uh, installed actually are sensors that tell you where things uh, are operating or where they aren't. Uh, you can nowadays, so that when the tree fell on the distribution uh, or the feeder line uh, before, uh, the way the utilities found it was, first of all, they waited for somebody to call them. Uh, and complain, and then they sent the truck out with the flashlight to look at the, at the wires until they found the one that the tree fell on. Um, you can actually do that in a communicating system. You can do that automatically now, go right to the, to the spot where it happens. So uh, it's more resilient even now uh, and can be much better in the future, particularly as we begin to manage this much more complex system. So uh, in terms of the renewable side of things, we actually have to, to uh, uh, pay attention to the fact that the, the uh, resource is not uniformly distributed in time. Um, if you, uh, these curves show, um, the top two uh, show the net load curve in uh, uh, the California uh, independent system operator territory for 2012 and 2013. And starting with the, the curve that's labeled 2014, this uh, so-called duck curve shows you the effect of big solar generation in the daytime. Now, uh, that's great. Uh, lots of, uh, of solar power into the, uh, the system, uh, but a pretty big ramp rate, 13,000 megawatts in three uh, hours uh, as the sun gets low on the horizon. So managing deep penetration of renewables, being able to operate uh, uh, complex systems of, of assets is gonna be a challenge that we have to work on as well. Storage is another aspect of this. Um, it, uh, electrons, uh, for the most part, our grid is one that's been balanced with, uh, with generation and load uh, uh, matched as closely as possible. Um, in a system with, uh, with much more intermittency involved, uh, storage would be useful, and storage on a variety of scales. On the small scale for transportation, uh, batteries uh, look like the right solution. In the intermediate scale, things like flow batteries offer some, uh, some grid scale uh, storage. Uh, and then there's pumped hydro and compressed air storage for uh, larger scale systems. Lots of work going on in this area, lots more to be done, lots of uh, research opportunities here. So 
assuming that we now have um, uh, set in motion the kinds of things that we will need to do for a clean uh, uh, for a grid that can manage all this clean power, now we better generate some of the clean power, so let me say a few words about that. Um, the, uh, uh, right now, the uh, coal and uh, uh, coal generates about, I eh, call it a third, a little more than a third of the electricity. That's actually down. Uh, competition by uh, low-cost natural gas has made it uh, 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 harder for the, the older, uh, least efficient coal plants to compete. Uh, and the, uh, the new uh, rules for, the, uh, uh, for uh, carbon emissions and other things like mercury emissions uh, will change the landscape as well. Um, this is a picture of a, uh, of a plant where uh, a uh, large-scale carbon capture and storage project will be uh, uh, installed. And uh, it's, it's pretty clear that we can separate CO2 from combustion product streams, or alternately, we can separate oxygen from nitrogen and burn with pure oxygen, so you make uh, CO2. Uh, cost is the issue. Um, these things, uh, we separate commercial quantities of CO2 from other gases uh, every day in refining and, uh, and natural gas processing, processing operations. Uh, but we're talking about a much bigger scale and we need lower costs. So the research opportunities include better, better separation techniques uh, uh, and the ability to predict where these fluids will go in the subsurface if they're injected. So uh, big computational uh, opportunities there as well. Um, now one of the things that has to happen, uh, with a little luck, this, uh, no, that, uh, that was supposed to be a video that uh, started back there, but since I can't go backwards, there we go. Now if we, uh, well, maybe the video will stop, but start. But in any case, uh, what happens, uh, there we go. Uh, that CO2 that gets separated in the power plant then needs to be compressed uh, to shove it underground. Um, and these, uh, these uh, compressors that do this, uh, they consume lots of energy. Uh, the, it turns out that the details of, uh, of how vortices shed uh, at the tips of the blades. Uh, those can be controlled with something like uh, tip injection. They offer some um, real uh, uh, opportunities for both better efficiency uh, and, uh, and technologies that can allow us to make better jet engines or, or gas turbines as well. So it's a place where the combination of very high resolution computing, uh, high resolution both in time and space, can help us manage the, in this case, the shocks that control angle of attack uh, uh, on the turbine blades, which in turn controls efficiency and either delays or, or uh, helps produce turbine uh, blade stalls that uh, can cause problems. So uh, a real opportunity for hypercorn computing to, to make it, to, it all work better uh, in the future. Uh, on the nuclear power side, um, uh, we have uh, about almost 20% of the nuclear power in this, 20% uh, of the electricity in this country is generated by nuclear power now. Um, we have five new nuclear power plants under construction in the, in the U.S., so there has been a bit of a, a renaissance there. Uh, cost is still an issue. Uh, spent fuel storage is an issue. Uh, and the future includes some possibilities for, for small modular reactors, uh, uh, a uh, fast uh, spectrum reactors that uh, uh, can change the, the waste storage picture, uh, and, uh, and lots of materials questions that have to do with life extension uh, of the existing power plant fleet. This picture is one of a small modular reactor, and the image on the right is uh, uh, a, uh, a picture of results from uh, uh, a project uh, that uh, um, is looking at in detail at modeling a, a, at very fine scale the performance of a nuclear power plant. Uh, this is an opportunity to, uh, to improve performance with uh, detailed simulations. Uh, uh, the problems are uh, fundamentally multi-scale and ones that uh, uh, have lots of potential for improvements in efficiency. And speaking of efficiency, um, the turbine I talked about a minute ago was one that uh, was for compressing CO2. Um, this one is, uh, runs the other way. So the, the turbine on the left side uh, in this uh, is a uh, steam turbine. They are everywhere in the power generation system. It's two-sided, it has five big turbine wheels, and the, the image of a, of a person there is, uh, 
It gives you some sense of the scale. That one's a 300 megawatt turbine. On the right side is a 300 megawatt turbine that uses supercritical high pressure CO2 as the working fluid. So turbines are just wings, uh, and mass flow over the wing is what generates the thrust that either keeps the airplane in the sky or makes the turbine turn. If you have a denser fluid like supercritical fuel CO2, uh, then you'd, you can make the turbine smaller. Now you say, okay, great, I'm sold. Uh, why don't we have these things everywhere? Well, as you can imagine, there are some uh, technical issues to be uh, to be sorted out. Many of them have to do with the material science uh, of all of this, so our ability to calculate and, uh, and predict properties of materials uh, in, a, uh, uh, in, a, in advance would help a lot here. Um, on the wind power side, um, uh, wind, as I already said, was, has really uh, come down in cost uh, for the best uh, areas. And we, we really have spent our lives modeling what happens at a single wind turbine uh, but in fact, people don't usually build single wind turbines. They put them in uh, wind farms, um, and depending on which way the wind is blowing, uh, the turbines uh, uh, can be partly shielded. Uh, but what a very interesting computational exercise has shown is that with uh, some combination of control over which way the, the, the turbine angles and the blade uh, pitches, you can actually steer the wakes a little bit and even just a little bit of steering can give you, in this case, a 14% improvement in the energy capture from that wind turbine um, without rebuilding anything. Uh, but it, is, uh, it really demands the computational resources uh, for a big system at fine scale to be able to do this uh, appropriately. Um, on the solar side, uh, again, big reductions in cost, but lots more that we can do. There's a host of new materials coming along that offer uh, potential for much lower costs. Uh, and uh, uh, to be fair, there's room to do better on the soft cost side of, uh, of what it costs, uh, the balance of system, the c permitting costs, and those kinds of things. It costs about twice as much to install uh, a solar PV system in the U.S. as it does in Germany, for example. So um, we, can do, uh, we can do better. Uh, so that's likely to be a resource that will uh, contribute much more in the future. So let me say a word about uh, transportation and vehicles. Um, so vehicles are uh, ubiquitous. I mean, we all uh, think we, uh, uh, we need to have multiple vehicles that we own, which mostly sit around uh, uh, not being used 98 or so percent of the time. Um, uh, so there's a whole host of opportunities to do better there. Now, the one great thing about uh, uh, liquid fossil fuels is that they pack high energy density. So you can put uh, gallons in the tank and go a long way. Um, you can imagine uh, electrifying some of, uh, of the urban transportation effort, for example. Um, that will require better batteries uh, and lower costs. Uh, but still, for the long haul, uh, trucking and, and probably for airplanes, uh, combustion is likely to continue to be an important component here. So combustion efficiency is a research opportunity. Uh, thinking about more carefully about uh, co-optimizing fuels and engines. Light weighting. Uh, uh, reducing the weight of what you push around uh, either through the sky on land uh, offers uh, uh, a big opportunity there. That's fundamentally, again, a materials problem. Can we, uh, can we make lightweight, strong, uh, safe materials that, uh, that do the job? Uh, various versions of electrification could be batteries, could be fuel cells, uh, and so on. Lots of opportunities there. And then we can think about the systems aspect of all of this. Um, all of us get in our car, and even, even now you can look at, uh, at one of the mapping software systems and have a shot at figuring out where the traffic jams are. You could imagine that our vehicles are going to help us do that uh, more carefully in the, in the future. And thinking about the systems aspect of how that works uh, offers some opportunities as well. Uh, on the advanced manufacturing side, um, I have to say this was an area that I knew less about when we uh, started working on this than I do now, and I'm really quite excited about the opportunities here. So this is a uh, 3D printer making a car. Um, it's sort of a rudimentary car. Uh, it, um, uh, that version turned into this. Uh, and then that turned into this. Uh, those of us who uh, uh, are from my area will recognize the, the Shelby Cobra 
had a 427 cubic inch uh, uh, piston engine in it, but this version is electric. Um, and what's interesting about this is this vehicle went from drawings to that car in six weeks. Um, so it was a 3D printed car. Um, and it makes the point that by judicious use of a combination, you can't do this without lots of computing, by the way, um, judicious use of our ability to translate uh, uh, computing into making a part uh, gives you the opportunity of one, reducing cycle time, so the cost of on designs is lower. It also offers, offers the opportunity to make parts that, uh, that are, um, that weigh less to do the same thing, that use less of the primary material. Uh, an example we like to use it has to do with the aircraft part. So the this traditional machining way of doing it takes eight times as much material as you actually end up with in the part. If you assemble it from, uh, from a powder with uh, um, electron beam heating to, to, to uh, fuse things together, then you you reduce the amount of material to one and a half times what you end up with, and you reduce the energy use over the life cycle of that product by a factor of three, because when you fly that around in an airplane, it takes fuel to fly weight. So, so there just is a host of opportunities across the manufacturing spectrum for doing things like this, for process intensification, for making uh, everything we do more efficient. So there's a message there as well. We should look across the energy systems and as systems as a whole and look for the opportunities to use energy efficiently. Making it efficient uh, is a big step along the way to reducing greenhouse gas um, uh, uh, emissions as well. So let me finish by just saying a word or two about the, uh, the enabling science here. Um, we, uh, at the Department of Energy, we run a host of, uh, of user facilities at uh, the 13 national labs in the, uh, 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 in the complex, the science and energy complex, uh, and then the, the, the three labs in the national security complex, Livermore, and Los Alamos also uh, do this as well. These are x-ray sources. Uh, they're used for materials characterization, uh, neutron sources. The example that's shown here that uh, that little turbine blade that's sitting in the middle there is shown next to the spallation neutron source at Oak Ridge. Um, it, um, the blade itself was made by additive manufacturing. So this is uh, one of the efficient manufacturing techniques. The image that's shown there is the residual stresses that exist in that blade after it's manufactured. Now those of us that ride around in airplanes would like those blades to hold together. That's a good thing. Uh, and being able to understand the state of stress within them uh, is a way to, uh, to, to uh, guarantee that the properties that you need uh, are also there as well. Um, so uh, I just will point out that virtually everything we do uh, in the energy space at some point arose from the fundamental understanding of science. So the combination of catalysis of nanostructure materials of being able to close the design loop uh, around uh, uh, materials properties that we want uh, computationally, that is a huge opportunity uh, going forward as well. And uh, then I'll close with the idea that, uh, that really advanced computing is, uh, is totally fundamental to, to uh, everything we do here. Um, we've, uh, we've made lots of progress that was, uh, if you think about the last two decades, for example, on the national security side, once we stopped testing nuclear weapons uh, uh, for real, we began testing them in, uh, in computing facilities. That demanded and led to a big advance in, in uh, computing power. Uh, that, of course, immediately, once it was available, immediately got adopted by the scientific community. Uh, we're embarking on another version of that now, um, and that offers many more opportunities for another big uh, advance in performance. Um, and this will require us to understand uh, uh, a variety of, of new uh, uh, ideas, uh, quantum computing, neuromorphic computing. Uh, these are ideas that are being, uh, being explored with 
scientific discovery that might be based on quantum mechanics and the chemistry of materials and particle physics. Um, the neuromorphic computing uh, mimics the neurological processes in the brain. Who knows, we might actually begin to understand something about how our brains uh, operate. Um, there's a, there's a, a real potential there. Um, and all, both of these really require development on kind of a decade scale of, uh, for forward. Um, this will involve both technology developments uh, and systems developments and underpinnings and mathematics and science. Uh, and so there is uh, something for all of us uh, to do in, in this world. Uh, I would say that we're entering another uh, period, a really exciting potential performance in uh, computing uh, with great challenges that really do matter. Uh, so it's a great time to be working in this area. So um, in case you don't want to read all 500 pages of the Quadrennial Technology Review, uh, though I do actually recommend it. It really is quite fascinating reading. Um, uh, let me give it to you in, uh, in four bullets. Uh, and then I'll note also that in, in, if your particular favorite technology area is not covered in enough detail in the main report, uh, there are uh, uh, many individual technology assessments that are available on our website, energy.gov slash QTR. So here's where we stand on the energy technology world. We've made lots of progress. Uh, it really is quite heartening to see the, uh, uh, the progress we've made and uh, the fact that uh, greenhouse gas emissions have, uh, have gone down in this country uh, uh, in the last few years, so that's exciting. Uh, but there's lots more to do. Um, this is a multi-decade endeavor that we're embarked on uh, and we need to work hard on it and stick with it over time. There's a huge opportunity space, both for individual technologies and for uh, improved energy systems that use our ability to understand and uh, compute our way through complex systems um, that, uh, that will allow us to uh, uh, make these systems work much better in the future. We really do have to have a portfolio here. Uh, uh, research uh, takes place in the spectrum of, of not knowing exactly which technologies and which uh, approaches will uh, mature the most quickly. So that needs to be fully stocked across primary energy resources, the ways we convert those into services, uh, with lots of different system scales and time scales for application, and efficiency everywhere. We really need to make that a primary metric that we use in, a, in addition to cost uh, uh, going forward. Uh, and then to finish, the enabling science uh, and computing uh, capabilities are absolutely fundamental to all of this, uh, and we'll, uh, we can't imagine going forward at the pace we need to without them as well. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll close and say thank you very much, uh, and I'm happy to try to respond to questions if they're not too hard. Thank you. Thank you very much for this really interesting talk uh, on the security or. So uh, we have microphones left and right. Uh, please line up and if you want to have a question or you can submit it through the app if you are interested. So perhaps like the first, until the first people come up, I ask a question. Okay. Um, global warming and the, the energy issues, it's, it's, it's a global problem. And um, so, you, your ministry, as I understand, is also responsible for funding science and so on. So why don't we have more international funding available for collaborative science across the world? Mm -hmm. I know there was a G8 had like a few little mm -hmm. things, but it's not on a big scale. It's a big problem, so. Yeah, it is a big problem, and uh, uh, we're slowly edging our way toward uh, to making the commitments to do something. I think uh, the, the approach to the uh, COP21 meeting in Paris in a couple of weeks uh, with uh, more than 150 countries now announcing uh, goals for their particular settings, that's a start. Um, I think we can actually look to the science community for an, some examples of, of how to do this. Um, the uh, CERN collaboration uh, uh, that produced the Large Hadron Collider and uh, the Higgs uh, uh, boson uh, results is one example of a big international collaboration. We're, we're working on uh, one now that involves uh, uh, neutrinos. Um, and there is lots of conversation uh, among uh, uh, 
uh, uh, research groups around the world. Uh, it's, uh, it's mostly funded in our individual places uh, uh, as of now, but uh, you're probably right that there's room for more collaboration. Okay. Uh, so actually, uh, uh, some questions were submitted. I just, my device didn't work. <laughs> uh, what we need is better communication. Okay. okay. Um, so first question uh, was very popular. Does the need for a sustainable energy supply combined with climate change imply that nuclear energy use must increase? Well, I think nuclear is, a, is a, uh, an important component of the energy mix. Um, we, we uh, having a baseload uh, source of electric power that, um, that has very low greenhouse gas emissions, really just from the steel and concrete in the, in the plant, uh, is an important component. But there are some problems we have to sort out. We have to deal with the spent fuel problem, uh, and, we, uh, and we have to deal with the cost challenges uh, as well. But I do think it needs to be an important component going uh, forward, and we need to work hard to make that happen. Uh, do you see a role of in-home batteries now to lower carbon emissions today? Okay, so that's a very good question, the role of in-home batteries. Um, so, uh, the, so the question is what service are those batteries going to provide? Now, for those that own an electric vehicle, for example, you can imagine that having a battery means that you could still be charged up to go to work even if the power's off. Uh, uh, in your neighborhood. I, I live in a neighborhood in, the, in California when I'm there that uh, where the wiring was uh, installed in the 1910s and it's iffy uh, at times. Uh, so that would be a service that people might uh, very well be willing to pay for. And the ability to run your house with, when the grid's offline is something that uh, some people have generators now. So those are both services that have value. There's talk of being able to use this as a balancing component on the grid as a whole, uh, but we'll need to figure out market valuation for the service that that person has paid for, the capital cost for, and provide. Uh, and so all of this is a long-winded way of saying that, you know, I don't really know for sure how that's going to play out. I think it's a very interesting area and one that, uh, uh, that uh, has a, a lot of potential, but uh, much more to be thought about before we know for sure what happens. Okay, so perhaps you also have time for like at least one question at the microphone. So you uh, spoke briefly about the uh, Department of Energy Research Laboratories. What barriers do you see in transitioning the technologies developed at the laboratories into an industry practice and making sure that industry needs are aligned with what's going on in the laboratories? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good question. We, have, uh, we actually have uh, put a fair amount of effort into this uh, area of late. Uh, we've had several uh, national commissions that have looked at the labs and looked at ways to streamline the relationship with industry both ways, uh, with results coming out of the labs but also making uh, possible for uh, for industry to, to uh, work with the labs, actually a quite significant component of the work that's done at the, at the, the X-ray light sources, for example, is actually uh, industry sponsored uh, as well, including beam lines. Um, but we've also established in, in uh, uh, the science and energy part of uh, DOE, we've, we've established a new office of technology transitions that's aimed at, at streamlining and coordinating and make it, making it much more possible for, uh, to build those links between the, the labs uh, and industry. So um, uh, we have more to do for sure, but, uh, but you're right, it's a, the labs are this uh, science and technology powerhouse uh, and we should leverage that both ways. Okay, perhaps one quick question. Yes, and Takaki, what is your estimate on the future amount of the fossil fuels, a future trend of the price, and how can we help with that? So the, the question, I think the question is, uh, what's the future trend for fossil fuels? Um, this is the, the time where I should say, do not invest based on anything I'm about to say. <laughs> if you look at my track record of investing, you would definitely not do what I say. Um, uh, so fossil fuels, because they provide a, an extremely valuable service uh, in terms of energy density, they will be with us for an extended period. Um, so we need to make sure that we use them as efficiently as possible. Um, and then uh, to the extent, for example, that methane stays in the electric power generation mix over time, uh, we need to work on carbon capture and storage for that as well. Now, it actually is because what comes out of a, a, a gas-fired power plant is cleaner than what comes out of a coal plant. Um, that, uh, that looks uh, 
uh, like it might even be a little less expensive there. But so we'll need to balance those two. And over time, the fraction of fossil fuels is likely to decline, but it will take a long time. Thank you very much, uh, Under Secretary Orr, for these interesting insights and, and showing us a little bit that our work is like has some influence on the world's problem. And, and thank you very, very much. Important. Thank you all.